and uh, I have to introduce him, of course. Yeah, you have some time to get the microphone then. <laughs> so the next person to speak is our keynote speaker, yeah. And it's special to me because he, he was born two days after my father. And they both love camping and open source. <laughs> Every time I should say open source, I should hear like, whoa, like open source. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, you're amazing. <laughs> so our key guest uh, has been linked to space very early and uh, because he was training an astronaut, the famous Buzz. Buzz. You know Buzz, the astronaut. Buzz Lightyear from Toy Story 2. Yeah, you can find him on the credits of Toy Story 2. And uh, mixed with that, you had the fact that he's an early Unix kernel programmer that makes somebody who is behind the creation of the Open Source Initiative, the Open Research Institute, and many other things you will find on his Wikipedia page. So you will understand why he's here today, and with no further ado, this is Bruce Perens. So, uh, so I really appreciate the welcome from that red wine guy. <laughs> and uh, I, I like this. You know, if you push this, it launches the missile. So we hit it here so Donald Trump wouldn't <laughs> bomb Denmark. Um, so I come from Berkeley. That's the other side of the country. And um, so why are we doing open source now, just in case there's somebody in the room who isn't one over yet? Uh, it, it's something that I've been telling businesses and government, because uh, last week I was at the EU consultation on standards essential patents and open source. Okay, so this is a very important thing for open source um, because we want to be able to implement European standards, but European standards may have this thing called FRAND patents. FRAND stands for fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory, which is absolutely true until it comes to open source, which is locked out. And uh, so I've been uh, teaching uh, Etsy and some of the other European standards organizations how to work with open source and why they need to. And the very important point here is that the Linux kernel, for example, is a project that no one business could have done. Okay, say IBM wanted to do that it would never have become this large and this powerful. Just this year, it grew by 225,000 lines of code, uh, and that's from contribution by at least 3,300 uh, programmers. And the Linux Foundation actually employs two programmers. Okay, everybody else who worked on Linux was not paid by the Linux Foundation. They came from other companies that had an interest in Linux, from academia, from all over. So we have this intensely powerful mechanism to make real products. Okay, these are real products that are sort of the good of a social movement rather than a company. And um, so in 1985, Richard Stallman released the GNU Manifesto. So this is announcing free software. And then in 1998, a group of people and myself decided that we would promote open source as a way of marketing this free software concept to business. And in 1998, I wrote what was called the open source definition. I first wrote it for the Debian project, not for open source at all. And it defined what an open source license was, and no lawyer would help me. Okay, so I had to figure all of this law out by myself, and, and I went to communication art school. I learned to be a filmmaker. Um, 
So nobody in 1998 believed that we could do much of anything. So imagine telling your friends this in 1998. My friends, I've never met them. From the internet, we're going to write an encyclopedia and we'll write a million articles and we'll put the English Encyclopedia Britannica out of business. And then, you know, because they don't even print it anymore. And then we're going to make a free operating system that, uh, that doesn't belong there, whatever reason it's there. You see, they had to project me on a window system. And um, so we're going to make a free operating system that becomes the basis of everything you do. It will be the operating system of the Falcon 9 rocket and it will be the backbone of the internet and your air traffic control will work on it. And we'll, we'll make it free and we'll have the source code available to everyone. So people, if I had said this back then, would have said, are you using TCP IP or LSD? <laughs> and so the whole point here is nobody understood the economics of open source. And it's still very hard to understand, but hopefully you can explain it to other people once you see this talk. So first of all, it's the most effective way to operate software development among large, very loosely organized teams. We have not yet found a better one. Many people have tried about 100 different alternatives to open source have been tried. My favorite was Microsoft had this thing called shared source. It was open source without all of those troublesome rights. And um, they failed. And they finally, they joined the open source initiative. And, uh, you know, because they're a big company, they have one half that joined the open source initiative and the other half that wants us to pay a license to have a fat file system driver. But at least they're getting in line. Um, so, obviously, there are economics behind the vast adoption of open source. And to understand them, we have to understand what is business differentiating software and what is non-business differentiating software. So, business differentiating software makes a business more desirable than its competitors to the customer. So back, oh, 10, 15 years ago when Amazon.com started, Amazon had a recommendation system that at that time was their business differentiator. And if you bought a book, it would say, people who bought a book like this also bought this book. And about 75% of the time, they'd click buy on that second book. And all of the expense of operating their business was in selling the first book and shipping it to the customer. So that increased their profit. So for that year, the recommendation system was Amazon's business differentiator. And they could not open source that because they couldn't afford to give it to all of their competitors. Then the year after that, everybody got it anyway. Okay, so business differentiators rot over time. At the same time, Amazon was using Linux, they were using PHP. Imagine building a business that size on PHP. I, I still don't understand how it works. <laughs> and so, um, and all of these things were open source, and Amazon could afford to cooperate in developing Linux and PHP with Bertelsmann and the other bookstores because that wasn't their business. They, they sold books, they sold things, they, they didn't make operating systems. Operating systems were a cost center in their company. So, Operating systems were not business differentiating for Amazon. And we have a lot of software that's like that. Infrastructure, middleware, cellular radio protocol stacks, that's aimed at Etsy because they're doing 5G. 
um, they're all non-business differentiating. And in general, the very best thing that you can do with this non-differentiating software is distribute the cost and risk of its development across multiple companies through open source development. So Amazon and Bertelsmann, for example, could work on Linux and PHP, and they would each save money, and then they would spend that money on the more important parts of their business. For example, developing business differentiating software. Um, so for science, okay, we're not for the get for the most part, we're not for-profit businesses in the science world. The question for us is how do we distribute the fruits of our research to society most successfully? And as proven by organizations like CERN, which uses the GPL3 license and open source for their code, Open source that can be used and improved by everyone is often a better technology transfer policy than monopoly patents that mainly benefit one company. So how will I make money is the wrong question. Most businesses save money by using open source and they transfer their saved dollars to more important things for their business, and thus the effectiveness of the business and its profit is increased. So for us in science, we have a different motivation, and now we have an old and a new technology transfer method. So the monopoly incentive that we used to use, we used to patent the results of our research and sell that patent to a single company that would productize the invention. Well, that works very well when you need a very large front-end investment to fund commercialization of a product, but that's not software. It's not many kinds of modern work. So for most work, the monopoly incentives that we use when we patent our research actually harm adoption of technology simply because it's easy for one business to fail and not productize the invention. Whereas if we open source the technology, many businesses would be making use of it and some of them would succeed in getting it out to the public. So open source development has evolved since we started it. So 20 years ago, this is Neanderthal open source developer. He's a guy, of course. And um, he could only develop for ICT, so he could write internet and OS, things like that, using primitive tools. So he had a laptop and he had the GNU C compiler. And at that time, uh, you could only develop RF and you could only develop application-specific integrated circuits in a multi-million or billion dollar laboratory. So this is a key site vector network analyzer. It costs more than my home. And um, of course, this is an IC fabrication lab. And those are the kinds of things that you use to need to make the technology that we're now making in open source. So what changed? The advent of software-defined radio and inexpensive gate array development platforms put laboratory capabilities formally accessible only to large corporations within the reach of the individual. And there's also been a rise of other empowering tools such as 3D printing, small computer numerical controlled milling machines, etc. cetera. Um, so this is the modern open source person. So she's a girl. This is the only normal picture I found of you. And <laughs> so, um, so she develops for RF and Gatorade. Okay, so she's got 
uh, the RTL SDR, which is our $27.95 SDR system, HackRF, a more powerful one, okay, a GNU radio sketch. So this is how we develop RF. Okay, when I learned, when I was, I, I first got my ham radio license about 1974, and I was soldering together resistors and capacitors. We, we still do that, but we can also make radio design this way. So this is a weather radio with a GUI display of the FFT uh, for frequency domain and waterfall data. Um, and so we now have an open source movement which is more powerful and can do more things and has its own place in space. So I was really lucky they had a ham radio convention in Florida at the same time as the Falcon 9 Heavy launch. And I got to go see the Falcon 9 Heavy launch. I live about five hours from Vandenberg, so I drive to those launches once in a while. They always scrub them and I have to drive back home. Um, so uh, Debian, the Debian operating system, which I worked on, first flew on the space shuttle in 1997 as part of biosciences and my, my, microgravity research. SpaceX is very heavily open source based. I got this from one of their board of directors. Uh, Dragon and Falcon 9, they run Linux. And in the Falcon 9, that's, that's just one of these three things. There are six of the universal software radio peripheral. This is an SDR made for open source work, specifically with GNU radio. And uh, for each of the USRPs that they use, they save $200,000 over a purpose-built space radio transceiver. So that's how they can launch a Falcon 9 for $60 million instead of about $300 million, which is what the competitor here in Europe would charge. And uh, SpaceX ground facilities run LabVIEW, which is a proprietary product on Linux. Um, okay. So open source CubeSats, we're doing them. Entirely open source and open hardware CubeSats are now the state of the art and are being pursued by multiple organizations. But what do we do about all these crazy laws? So we have in the United States, ITAR and EAR, and they say, well, we don't want rocket technology in the hands of the North Koreans, for example. But we want to run international collaboration on the internet. We can't really lock anyone out. So it turns out that open source is actually the only viable strategy for international collaboration. Munitions laws are intended to keep advanced weapons and their technology out of the hands of nations that might use them against us. Munitions laws like ITAR and EAR are designed to protect proprietary technology of companies from being revealed to other nations. So the proprietary part is very important here. What if it's not proprietary? Well, it turns out that those laws have legal carve outs for basic science, for scientific conferences, for publications, for public libraries. And if you publish your work as open source as you make it, and keep your project discussions on public mailing lists, it's not subject to the United States export laws. Okay? So we can do things in the United States that nobody else can do until they decide we're going to have no secrets in our organization. So Michelle over there and I, spun Open Research Institute off of AMSAT in order to pursue public development of technology based in the US. The Libre Space guys were Greek and they had a whole nother set of laws to deal with. Um, and 
it would otherwise be restricted by our own country's munitions at, uh, export laws. Uh, and it's operated so that all work becomes public as it is made. We have other troublesome laws to deal with. This is, this is really complicated compared to most open source development. The cryptographers have dealt with this to some extent because they had export laws too. So US licenses space photography uh, through a government uh, uh, organization you can't have too high resolution. You can't image Israel and some other battle zones because they don't want those to fall into the hands of people who would send bombs over there. Um, so quite a lot of law. This is my favorite. This thing is about 100 miles from my home. It's called Pave Paws. And it's a um, space surveillance radar. And this works for NORAD. So NORAD tracks all of the objects in orbit. And we know that NORAD is tracking a wire tie. OK, there's a wire tie that an astronaut dropped in 1989, and it's in the NORAD catalog. Um, but FCC, when they give you your radio license, they decline to license satellites smaller than 1U because NORAD can only track so many wire ties, OK? Only so many uh, devices with low radar reflective capability. And because they're the military, they can't tell us how many. They can't tell us very much about it at all. But so it may be that they can track 1 tenth U but they don't want us to know that, so they only license 1U and larger CubeSats. Um, so Open Research Institute, our organization, is working on some things that Michelle will talk about later today. So we have the DVD, D, um, Digital Video Broadcast S2X open source implementation. So you get satellite television that way. But we do it without television as the main payload. Uh, we started out as the ground station project. Uh, we're now both the satellite and the ground station project. And this facilitates consolidation of thousands of slow to medium speed uplinks into a single high speed downlink stream. So you can have a satellite that illuminates an entire continent and say 1,000 radio hams are uplinking digital data in that continent and it all comes down in one digital stream which they all decode and thus everyone can hear everyone else. So the original mission for this was for emergency services uh, in the United States uh, it was sponsored by FEMA, the emergency organization in the United States. And we had a ride to space, but we had a ride to geostationary. But unfortunately, the ride has now evaporated, and we're looking for a new ride. Um, so we'll probably be making this for CubeSats in the near future. Um, we have our own CubeSat project. It's just starting. We're looking for more technical leadership. I'll know that there is enough technical leadership when I don't have to push the project along by myself. And um, the satellite that we're building will do digital communications for radio amateurs. Uh, the members are bored with low orbit analog amateur satellites. They want high Earth orbit digital satellites. Thus, they must be radiation tolerant. OK, so these are things you don't have to deal with in low Earth orbit. Uh, radiation can cause soft errors, but the real problem is physical damaged components. Components eventually fail due to the radiation dose if they remain in orbit long enough. We actually have a satellite more than 40 years old which is still operating. 
that AMSAT launched. It's the oldest operating satellite. But the computer is dead and the battery is dead, so when it gets in the sun, it just goes into some random radio mode and stays there until it goes into shadow again. Um, so radiation-induced latch-up between a detail of an integrated circuit and the substrate can physically destroy a gate. It can overcurrent the device, and that's the real worry that we have. So one solution is to use a non-conductive substrate. So we go to silicon on insulator or silicon on sapphire. This is very expensive for open source projects, okay? But we have to do it. Simply resetting a latched up chip is insufficient if the latch up current damages the device. So an, uh, an inexpensive strategy is to use a component that is inherently radiation tolerant due to its fabrication details. So some gate arrays are like that. Uh, for example, CERN is creating a RISC-V CPU on uh, microsemi igloo with triplicated logic, and that is good for about 100 kilorads radiation dose. And then um, this is the expensive strategy. Vorigo has fabricated an ARM Cortex M0 on silicon on insulator, and they've triplicated the registers. They have been triplicated all of the logic. And that's useful up to about a 400 kilorad dose and also extreme temperatures. But what we get is what would otherwise be a $5 CPU now costs $1,000, okay? So what I think we should get together and do is crowdfund fabrication of the CERN design or another RISC-V on silicon on insulators so that it's more affordable for all of us. Because what you find is all of these companies are really trying to pay for their research with the high cost of their chip, not for the fabrication of the chip itself. We're the open source community. We don't have to do that. So the future is coming. In the future, open source will assume a dominant role in academic and nonprofit small satellites. And it will provide the basis of many commercial small satellites. Why is that going to happen? Because our groups are going to fly satellites that are open source. And by flying them, we will develop space heritage. Okay, and anybody who wants their mission to succeed looks for space heritage. They look for a design that has flown and did work. And we will make these available to the general public as open source. So in a few years, just a few, when you want a design with proven space heritage, you will go to the open source community for that. Open Research Institute, our organization, plans to organize an online library of open source space technology in one place. That doesn't mean we're taking over your website. We'll just provide pointers to here and there. But I know, for example, that many of the college projects, eventually people graduate. They lose their developers. The site falls off the web, et cetera. So we're going to make sure that this is preserved instead. And we also plan to commoditize manufacture of open source designs for use by others at lower cost than the commercial satellite manufacturers. So this is taken from another organization called TAPR, T-A-P-R, that makes a lot of SDR equipment, et cetera. And they fund their organization that way. So when we manufacture a CubeSat, why make just one or two? Why not make 100 and sell the other 90, even to universities? Why should you be using a, a fake satellite in your classroom? Universities could probably afford a real one this way. So these are things that we are looking to work upon. 
we need volunteers to help us with them. It doesn't matter what country you're from. Um, and uh, we'll pay you all of nothing and appreciate you very highly. <laughs> all right. Um, and I, I was actually looking to see if they charge us for the coffee now. Um, <laughs> all right. Thanks very much. That's all for today for me. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. So we're very, very lucky to have Bruce. Uh, he'll be here for the two days, right, Bruce? Uh, yeah. With uh, his colleague, Michelle. So do not hesitate to reach out to them. Uh, that take benefit.